Meredith came accordingly in the evening, when we talked my affair over. He had conceived a great regard for me, and was very unwilling that I should leave the house while he remained in it. He dissuaded me from returning to my native country, which I began to think of. He reminded me that Keimer was in debt for all he possessed, that his creditors began to be uneasy, that he kept his shop miserably, sold often without profit for ready money, and often trusted without keeping accounts, that he must therefore fall, which would make a vacancy I might profit of. I objected my want of money. He then let me know that his father had a high opinion of me, and, from some discourse that had passed between them, he was sure would advance money to set us up, if I would enter into partnership with him. My time, says he, will be out with Keimer in the spring. By that time we may have our press and types in from London. I am sensible, I am no workman, if you like it, your skill in the business shall be set against the stock I furnish, and we will share the profits equally. The proposal was agreeable, and I consented. His father was in town and approved of it, the more as he saw I had great influence with his son, had prevailed on him to abstain long from dram-drinking, and hoped might break him of that wretched habit entirely. I gave an inventory to the father who carried it to a merchant. The things were sent for, the secret was to be kept till they should arrive, and in the meantime I was to get work, if I could, at the other printing house. But I found no vacancy there, and so remained idle a few days, when Keimer, on a prospect of being employed to print some paper money in New Jersey, which would require cuts in various types that I only could supply, and apprehending Bradford might engage me and get the job from him, sent me a very civil message, that old friends should not part for a few words. Meredith persuaded me to comply, as it would give more opportunity for his improvement under my daily instructions. So I returned, and we went on more smoothly than some time before. The New Jersey job was obtained. I contrived a copper plate press for it, the first that had been seen in the country. I cut several ornaments and checks for the bills. We went together to Burlington, where I executed the whole to satisfaction, and he received so large a sum for the work as to be enabled thereby to keep his head much longer above water. At Burlington I made an acquaintance with many principal people of the province. Several of them had been appointed by the assembly a committee to attend the press, and take care that no more bills were printed than the law directed. They were therefore by turns constantly with us, generally he who attended brought with him a friend or two for company. My mind having been much more improved by reading than Keimer's, I suppose it was for that reason my conversation seemed to be more valued. They had me to their houses, introduced me to their friends, and showed me much civility, while he, though the master, was a little neglected. In truth, he was an odd fish, ignorant of common life, fond of rudely opposing received opinions, enthusiastic in some points of religion, and a little knavish withal. We continued there near three months, and by that time I could reckon among my acquired friends Judge Allen, Samuel Bustill, the Secretary of the Province, Isaac Pearson, Joseph Cooper, and several of the Smiths, members of the Assembly, and Isaac Decau, the Surveyor General. The latter was a shrewd, sagacious old man, who told me that he began for himself when young by wheeling clay for the brickmakers, learned to write after he was of age, carried the chains for surveyors, who taught him surveying, and he had now, by his industry, acquired a good estate, and says he, I foresee that you will soon work this man out of business, and make a fortune in it at Philadelphia. He had not then the least intimation of my intention to set up there or anywhere. These friends were afterwards of great use to me, as I occasionally was to some of them. They all continued their regard for me as long as they lived." Before I entered upon my public appearance in business, it may be well to let you know the then state of my mind with regard to my principles and morals, that you may see how far those influenced the future events of my life. My parents had early given me religious impressions, and brought me through my childhood piously in the dissenting way. But I was scarce fifteen when, after doubting by turns of several points, as I found them disputed in the different books I read, I began to doubt of revelation itself. Some books against deism fell into my hands. They were said to be the substance of sermons preached at Boyle's lectures. 
it happened they wrought an effect on me quite contrary to what was intended by them. For the arguments of the deists, which were quoted to be refuted, appeared to me much stronger than the refutations. In short, I soon became a thorough deist. My arguments perverted some others, particularly Collins and Ralph, but each of them having afterwards wronged me greatly with the least compunction, and recollecting Keith's conduct toward me, who was another free thinker, and my own towards Vernon and Miss Reed, which at times gave me great trouble, I began to suspect that this doctrine, though it might be true, was not very useful. My London pamphlet, which had for its motto these lines of Dryden, Whatever is, is right. Though pure blind man sees but a part of the chain, the nearest link, his eyes not carrying to the equal beam that poises all above. And from the attributes of God, his infinite wisdom, goodness, and power, concluded that nothing could possibly be wrong in the world, and that vice and virtue were empty distinctions. No such things existing appeared now not so clever a performance as I once thought it, and I doubted whether some error had not insinuated itself unperceived into my argument, so as to infect all that followed, as is common in metaphysical reasonings. I grew convinced that truth, sincerity, and integrity in dealings between man and man were of the utmost importance to the felicity of life, and I formed written resolutions, which still remain in my journal book, to practice them ever while I lived. Revelation had indeed no weight with me, as such, but I entertained an opinion that, Though certain actions might not be bad because they were forbidden by it, or good because it commanded them, yet probably these actions might be forbidden because they were bad for us, or commanded because they were beneficial to us, in their own natures, all the circumstances of things considered. And this persuasion, with the kind hand of providence, or some guardian angel, or accidental favorable circumstances and situations, or altogether preserved me through this dangerous time of youth, and the hazardous situations I was sometimes in among strangers, remote from the eye and advice of my father, without any willful gross immorality or injustice that might have been expected from my want of religion. I say willful because the instances I have mentioned had something of necessity in them, from my youth, inexperience, and the knavery of others. I had therefore a tolerable character to begin the world with, I valued it properly and determined to preserve it. We had not long returned to Philadelphia before the new types arrived from London. We settled with Keimer and left him by his consent before he heard of it. We found a house to hire near the market and took it. To lessen the rent, which was then but twenty-four pounds a year, though I have since known it to be let for seventy, we took to Thomas Godfrey a glazer and his family, who were to pay a considerable part of it to us. We had scarce opened our letters and put our press in order before George House, an acquaintance of mine, brought a countryman to us, whom he had met in the street inquiring for a printer. All our cash was now expended in the variety of particulars we had been obliged to procure, and this countryman's five shillings, being our first fruits, and coming so seasonably, gave me more pleasure than any crown I have since earned, and the gratitude I felt toward House has made me more often ready than perhaps I should otherwise have been to assist young beginners. There are croakers in every country, always boding its ruin. Such a one then lived in Philadelphia, a person of note, an elderly man with a wise look, a very grave manner of speaking. His name was Samuel Mickle. This gentleman, a stranger to me, stopped one day at my door and asked me if I was the young man who had lately opened a new printing house. Being answered in the affirmative, he said he was sorry for me because it was an expensive undertaking and the expense would be lost, for Philadelphia was a sinking place. The people already half bankrupts, or near being so, all appearances to the contrary, such as new buildings and the rise of rents, being to her certain knowledge fallacious, for they were, in fact, among the things that would soon ruin us. He gave me such a detail of misfortunes now existing, that he left me half melancholy, 
Had I known him before I engaged in this business, probably I never should have done it. This man continued to live in this decaying place and to declaim the same strain, refusing for many years to buy a house there because all was going to destruction. And at last I had the pleasure of seeing him give five times as much for one as he might have bought it when he first began his croaking. I should have mentioned before that, in the autumn of the preceding year, I had formed most of my ingenious acquaintance into a club of mutual improvement, which we called the Junto. We met on Friday evenings. The rules that I drew up required that every member, in his turn, should produce one or more queries on any point of morals, politics, or natural philosophy, and once in three months produce and read an essay of his own writing on any subject he pleased. Our debates were to be under the direction of a president and to be conducted in the sincere spirit of inquiry after truth, without fondness for dispute or desire of victory, and to prevent warmth, all expressions of positiveness in opinions, or direct contradiction, were after some time made contraband and prohibited under small pecuniary penalties. The first members were Joseph Brightonall, a copier of deeds for their scriveners, a good-natured, friendly, middle-aged man, a great lover of poetry, reading all he could meet with, and writing some that was tolerable, very ingenious in many little knickknackeries and of sensible conversation. Thomas Godfrey, a self-taught mathematician, great in his way, and afterward inventor of what is now called Hadley's Quadrant, but he knew little out of his way and was not a pleasing companion, as, like most great mathematicians I have met, he expected universal precision in everything said, or was forever denying or distinguishing upon trifles to the disturbance of all conversation. He soon left us. Nicholas Skull, a surveyor, afterwards surveyor general, who loved books and sometimes made a few verses. William Parsons, bred a shoemaker but loving reading, had acquired a considerable share of mathematics, which he first studied with a view to astrology, that he afterwards laughed at it. He also became surveyor general. William Mogridge, a joiner, a most exquisite mechanic and a solid, sensible man, Hugh Meredith, Stephen Potts, and George Webb, I've characterized before. Robert Grace, a young gentleman of some fortune, generous, lively, and witty, a lover of punning and of his friends. And William Coleman, then a merchant's clerk about my age, who had the coolest, dearest head, the best heart, and the exactest morals of almost any man I ever met with. He became afterwards a merchant of great note, and one of our provincial judges. Our friendship continued without interruption to his death, upward of forty years, and the club continued almost as long, and was the best school of philosophy, morality, and politics that then existed in the province, for our queries, which were read the week preceding their discussion, put us upon reading with attention upon the several subjects that we might speak more to the purpose, and here, too, we acquired better habits of conversation, everything being studied in our rules, which might prevent our disgusting each other. From hence the long continuance of the club, which I shall have frequent occasion to speak further of hereafter. But my giving this account of it here is to show something of the interest I had, every one of these exerting themselves in recommending business to us. Brentonall particularly procured us from the Quakers the printing forty sheets of their history, the rest being done by Keimer, and upon this we worked exceedingly hard, for the price was low. It was a folio, pro patria size, in pica, with long primer notes. I composed of it a sheet a day, and Meredith worked it off at press. It was often eleven at night and sometimes later before I had finished my distribution for the next day's work, for the little job sent in by our other friends now and then put us back. But so determined I was to continue doing a sheet of day of the folio, that one night, when, having imposed my forms, I thought my day's work over, one of them by accident was broken, and two pages reduced to pieces. 
I immediately distributed and composed it over again before I went to bed, and this industry, visible to our neighbors, began to give us character and credit, particularly, I was told, that mention being made of the new printing office at the Merchants' Every Night Club. The general opinion was that it must fail, there being already two printers in the place, Keimer and Bradford. But Dr. Baird, whom you and I saw many years after at his native place, St. Andrews in Scotland, gave a contrary opinion. For the industry of that Franklin, says he, is superior to anything I ever saw of the kind. I see him still at work when I go home from the club, and he is at work again before his neighbors are out of bed. This struck the rest, and we soon after had offers from one of them to supply us with stationery, but as yet we did not choose to engage in shop business. I mention this industry the more particularly and the more freely, though it seems to be talking in my own praise, that those of my posterity, who shall read it, may know the use of that virtue when they see its effects in my favor throughout this relation. George Webb, who had found a female friend that lent him wherewith to purchase his time of Keimer, now came to offer himself as a journeyman to us. We could not then employ him, but I foolishly let him know as a secret that I soon intended to begin a newspaper, and might then have work for him. My hopes of success, as I told him, were founded on this, that the then only newspaper printed by Bradford was a paltry thing, wretchedly managed, no way entertaining, and yet was profitable to him. I therefore thought a good paper would scarcely fail of good encouragement. I requested Webb not to mention it, but he told it to Keimer, who immediately, to be beforehand with me, published proposals for printing one himself, on which Webb was to be employed. I resented this, and, to counteract them, as I could not yet begin our paper, I wrote several pieces of entertainment for Bradford's paper under the title of The Busybody, which Brentnell continued some months. By this means the attention of the public was fixed on that paper, and Keimer's proposals, which we burlesqued and ridiculed, were disregarded. He began his paper, however, and, after carrying it on three-quarters of a year, with at most only ninety subscribers, he offered it to me for a trifle, and I, having been ready for some time to go on with it, took it in hand directly, and it proved in a few years extremely profitable to me. I perceive that I am apt to speak in the singular number, though our partnership still continued. The reason may be that, in fact, the whole management of the business lay upon me. Meredith was no compositor, a poor pressman, and seldom sober. My friends lamented my connection with him, but I was to make the best of it. Our first papers made a quite different appearance from any before in the province, a better type and better printed. But some spirited remarks of my writing on the dispute then going on between Governor Burnett and the Massachusetts Assembly struck the principal people, occasioned the paper and the manager of it to be much talked of, and in a few weeks brought them all to be our subscribers. Their example was followed by many, and our number went on growing continually. This was one of the first good effects of my having learnt a little to scribble. Another was that the leading men, seeing a newspaper now and in the hands of one who could also handle a pen, thought it convenient to oblige and encourage me. Bradford still printed the votes and laws and other public business. He had printed an address of the house to the governor in a coarse, blundering manner. We reprinted it elegantly and correctly, and sent one to every member. They were sensible of the difference, it strengthened the hands of our friends in the house, and they voted us their printers for the year ensuing. Among my friends in the house I must not forget Mr. Hamilton, before mentioned, who was then returned from England and had a seat in it. He interested himself for me strongly in that instance, as he did in many others afterward, continuing his patronage till his death. Mr. Vernon, about this time, put me in mind of the debt I owed him, but did not press me. I wrote him an ingenious letter of acknowledgment, craved his forbearance a little longer, which he allowed me, and as soon as I was able I paid the principal with interest and many thanks, so that erratum was in some degree corrected. 
But now another difficulty came upon me which I had never the least reason to expect. Mr. Meredith's father, who was to have paid for our printing house, according to the expectations given me, was able to advance only one hundred pounds currency, which had been paid, and a hundred more was due to the merchant, who grew impatient and sued us all. We gave bail, but saw that, if the money could not be raised in time, the suit must soon come to judgment and execution, and our hopeful prospects must, with us, be ruined, as the press and the letters must be sold for payment, perhaps at half price. In this distress, two friends whose kindness I have never forgotten, nor ever shall forget while I can remember anything, came to me separately, unknown to each other, and, without any application from me, offering each of them to advance me all the money that should be necessary to enable me to take the whole business upon myself, if that should be practicable, but they did not like my continuing the partnership with Meredith, who, as they said, was often seen drunk in the streets and playing at low games in alehouses, much to our discredit. These two friends were William Coleman and Robert Grace. I told them I could not propose a separation while any prospect remained of the Meredithists fulfilling their part of our agreement, because I thought myself under great obligation to them for what they had done, and would do if they could, but if they finally failed in their performance and our partnership must be dissolved, I should then think myself at liberty to accept the assistance of my friends. Thus the matter rested for some time when I said to my partner, Perhaps your father is dissatisfied at the part you have undertaken in this affair of ours, and is unwilling to advance for you and me what he would for you alone. If that is the case, tell me, and I will resign the whole to you and go about my business. No, said he, my father has really been disappointed and is really unable, and I am unwilling to distress him farther. I see this is a business I am not fit for. I was bred a farmer, and it was a folly for me to come to town and put myself at thirty years of age an apprentice to learn a new trade. Many of our Welsh people are going to settle in North Carolina where land is cheap. I am inclined to go with them and follow my old employment. You may find friends to assist you, if you will take the debts of the company upon you, return to my father the hundred pound he has advanced, pay my little personal debts, and give me thirty pounds and a new saddle, I will relinquish the partnership and leave the whole in your hands. I agreed to this proposal. It was drawn up in writing, signed, and sealed immediately. I gave him what he demanded, and he went soon after to Carolina, from whence he sent me next year two long letters, containing the best account that had been given of that country, the climate, the soil, husbandry, etc., for in those matters he was very judicious. I printed them in the papers, and they gave great satisfaction to the public. As soon as he was gone, I recurred to my two friends, and because I would not give an unkind preference to either, I took half of what each had offered, and I wanted of one, and a half to the other, paid off the company's debt, and went on with the business in my own name, advertising that the partnership was dissolved. I think this was in or about the year 1729. About this time there was a cry among the people for more paper money, only 15,000 pounds being extant on the province, and that soon to be sunk. The wealthy inhabitants opposed any addition, being against all paper currency, from an apprehension that it would depreciate, as it had done in New England, to the prejudice of all creditors. We had discussed this point in our junto, where I was on the side of an addition, being persuaded that the first small sum struck in 1723 had done much good by increasing the trade, employment, and number of inhabitants in the province, since now I saw all the old house inhabited, and many new ones building, whereas I remembered well that when I first walked about the streets of Philadelphia eating my roll, I saw most of the houses in Walnut Street between Second and Front Streets with bills on their doors to be let, and many likewise in Chestnut Street and other streets, which made me then think the inhabitants of the city were deserting it one after another. Our debates possessed me so fully of the subject that I wrote and printed an anonymous pamphlet on it, entitled, The Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, 
It was well received by the common people in general, but the rich men disliked it, for it increased and strengthened the clamor for more money. And they, happening to have no writers among them that were able to answer it, their opposition slackened, and the point was carried by a majority in the house. My friends there, who conceived I had been of some service, thought fit to reward me by employing me in printing the money, a very profitable job and a great help to me. This was another advantage gained by my being able to write. The utility of this currency became, by time and experience, so evident as never afterward to be much disputed, so that it grew soon to fifty-five thousand pounds, and in 1739 to 80,000 pounds, since which it arose during war to upwards of 350,000 pounds, trade, building, and inhabitants all the while increasing, till now I think there are limits beyond which the quantity may be hurtful. I soon after obtained, through my friend Hamilton, the printing of the Newcastle paper money, another profitable job, as I then thought it, small things appearing great to those in small circumstances, and these, to me, were really great advantages, as they were great encouragements. He procured for me, also, the printing of the laws and votes of that government, which continued in my hands as long as I followed the business. I now opened a little stationer's shop. I had in it blanks of all sorts, the correctest that ever appeared among us, being assisted in that by my friend Brightonall. I had also paper, parchment, Chapman's books, etc., one white mash, a compositor I had known in London, an excellent workman, now came to me, and worked with me constantly and diligently, and I took an apprentice, the son of Aquila Rose. I began now gradually to pay off the debt I was under for the printing house. In order to secure my credit and character as a tradesman, I took care not only to be in reality industrious and frugal, but to avoid all appearances to the contrary. I dressed plainly, I was seen at no places of idle diversion, I never went out of fishing or shooting, a book indeed sometimes debauched me from my work, but that was seldom, snug, and gave no scandal, and to show that I was not above my business, I sometimes brought home the paper I purchased at the stores through the streets on a wheelbarrow, thus being esteemed an industrious thriving young man, and paying duly for what I bought. The merchants who imported stationery solicited my custom. Others proposed supplying me with books, and I went on swimmingly. In the meantime, Keimer's credit and business declining daily, he was at last forced to sell his printing house to satisfy his creditors. He went to Barbados and there lived some years in very poor circumstances. His apprentice, David Harry, whom I had instructed while I worked with him, set up in his place at Philadelphia, having bought his materials. I was at first apprehensive of a powerful rival in Harry, as his friends were very able and had a good deal of interest. I therefore proposed a partnership to him, which he, fortunately for me, rejected with scorn. He was very proud, dressed like a gentleman, lived expensively, took much diversion and pleasure abroad, ran in debt, and neglected his business, upon which— all business left him, and, finding nothing to do, he followed Keimer to Barbados, taking the printing house with him. There this apprentice employed his former master as a journeyman. They quarreled often. Harry went continually behindhand, and at length was forced to sell his types and return to his country work in Pennsylvania. The person that bought them employed Keimer to use them, but in a few years he died. There remained now no competitor with me at Philadelphia but the old one, Bradford, who was rich and easy, did a little printing now and then by straggling hands, but was not very anxious about the business. However, as he kept the post office, it was imagined he had better opportunities of obtaining news, his paper was thought a better distributor of advertisements than mine, and therefore had many more, which was a profitable thing to him and a disadvantage to me. For though I did indeed receive and send papers by the post, yet the public opinion was otherwise, for what I did send was by bribing the writers, who took them privately. Bradford, being unkind enough to forbid it, which occasioned some resentment on my part, and I thought so meanly of him for that, that 
when I afterward came into his situation, I took care never to imitate it. I had hitherto continued to board with Godfrey, who lived in part of my house with his wife and children, and had one side of the shop for his glazier's business, though he worked little, being always absorbed in his mathematics. Mrs. Godfrey projected a match for me with a relation's daughter, took opportunities of bringing us often together, till a serious courtship on my part ensued, the girl being in herself very deserving. The old folks encouraged me by continual invitation to supper, and by leaving us together till at length it was time to explain. Mrs. Godfrey managed our little treaty. I let her know that I expected as much money with their daughter as would pay off my remaining debt for the printing house, which I believe was not then above a hundred pounds. She brought me word they had no such sum to spare. I said they might mortgage their house. The answer to this, after some days, was that they did not approve the match, that, on inquiry of Bradford, they had been informed the printing business was not a profitable one, the types would soon be worn out and more wanted, that S. Keimer and D. Harry had failed one after the other, and I should probably soon follow them, and therefore I was forbidden the house and the daughter shut up. Whether this was a real change of sentiment, or only artifice, on a supposition of our being too far engaged in affection to retract, and therefore that we should steal a marriage, which would leave them at liberty to give or withhold what they pleased, I know not, but I suspected the latter.' 